Hello, watching this video will take 30 minutes of your time and leave you with a bunch of useless information about Breath of the Wild that is without a doubt, potentially, definitely worth watching, I guess. Let's go. Sometimes the weather reports on the Sheikah Slate are completely wrong. It'll show you nothing but sunny weather up ahead and then just start raining out of nowhere. Now you'd think the game would always give you an accurate forecast because why wouldn't it? So it's possible that these are just pop-up showers and the sun icon overrides the rain icon on the weather report, but this could also be a glitch. My research is inconclusive on that. I've only ever noticed this happening while it says it's sunny out but it's raining, not while it's cloudy and then it starts thunderstorming or anything like that. It's just every once in a while you look down at the weather to see when the rain is going to stop only to notice that it shouldn't be happening in the first place. With a Korok leaf wind gust, you can use your remote bombs to skip stones on the water. In normal conditions, circles and squares will skip out equidistantly from the shore. But if you skip into the wind, circles seem to skip a little bit farther than squares, which makes sense if you understand the game's physics well enough. Also, if you line up the bombs properly, you can detonate the square to blast circle way out across the water or back onto the shore. This doesn't always work, and it doesn't seem to work the other way around trying to launch the square by detonating circle. It'll always just despawn the square instead. But it is kind of fun if you got nothing else going on. Although it is yet to be better understood, there is a way to get a comically long animation when you deal the final Dark Beast death blow, as Link cinematically falls back down to the ground in slow motion. Usually what happens is a fade out to white shortly after the arrow explodes the eye. And as I said, why this animation happens is not all that understood, but it is a reoccurring phenomenon reported by multiple players. The best guesses I've seen hypothesized are a frame perfect B press as the arrow hits the eye, or otherwise doing something odd in the moments leading up to the shot while in bullet time or while entering bullet time. The piston launchers you see in the bomb shrine will launch Link farther if he's in the ragdoll state when they go off. So if you time it just right, you can launch Link on top of the bombable boulder blocks towards the end of the shrine. And in speedrunning, the chances of this happening is so low, it's considered lucky to have nailed it. And in those circles, this move is known as the ZDI cycle, named after the first player to pull it off and document that it's possible to even do. In casual play, trying to complete the shrine this way would be one of the most unorthodox and working harder, not smarter approaches you could possibly come up with. But the bottom line is, sometimes while Link is in ragdoll mode, the game gets confused and doesn't know exactly how to apply physics to his body. I find this happens most often when Link is forcefully shoved into a wall or the floor or a corner while in ragdoll state. The easiest way to replicate this is by wind bombing in tight spaces like shrines. You can sometimes get some really funky and sometimes hilarious effects with the animations. I've even gotten a sort of breakdancing head spin move. Another pretty funny and useless glitch I came across randomly while filming another scene was this infinite hop animation, initiated seemingly by landing on an awkward step up spot, uh, exiting a BLSS or something like that. I had to turn on the hand cam for this craziness just to show you. I am not holding any, I'm, this is just weird stuff. And I wasn't expecting that when I moved Link off the spot, he kind of kept in that state a little bit and then did it a bit on the ledge below for a moment before stopping and going back to normal. I expected him to go back to normal as soon as I touched the control stick at all. Pretty weird stuff. When Link gets wet, it generally takes about 20 seconds to dry off. There are variables, but the amount of time it takes to stop dripping is seemingly not affected by running, jumping, attacking, or just plain standing still. It could be the wind, or it could be the sunshine, as while well, standing out in the sun dried Link off faster than usual, but while standing right next to a campfire, it took the usual amount of time. If you just barely get Link's shins wet, he'll start dripping from head to toe, but if you get out of the water immediately, he'll dry off right away. If you get Link wet and then get completely out of the water, but then move in just a little bit up to his feet or his shins, he'll take forever to stop dripping, but he will eventually dry off. And if you get Link wet and then enter into a conversation with an NPC before he dries off, he will never stop dripping until you exit one of those text prompts. 
Oh, and just so you know, whenever you jump on any shopkeeper's product, they'll understandably get angry with you. You generally can't jump on store countertops inside buildings, but you can for the most part on the kiosk type businesses. Apparently, some shopkeepers will even have two or more variations of dialogue to tell you to get out of there, but I only ever got one unique response from every NPC that I disrespected in the name of research for this one. Every time I say how many different ways there are to open a treasure chest in this game, y'all point out another way to get it done. But I think this right here is the last method left unmentioned in this series. You can break open metal chests by using magnesis to move them into place, then running over to a cannon, firing a bomb at it, and then when you go over to check the chest, it'll be gone, but the contents will be laying on the ground. I mentioned in the 20 minute video that Zelda has three outfits we see in game. Now I base this off of the base game and then what I saw in creating a champion. But many of you wanted to clear it up that in a cutscene for the DLC quest champion Rivali song, we do see her in a winter jacket. And to be honest, I really did only remember seeing this outfit in Age of Calamity, but it is in Breath of the Wild as well. So thank you everyone who chipped in on that for keeping this series accurate. I mean, this outfit is so popular, there's even cosplay outfits available online. Apparently, many of you are skilled archers. Makes sense that you'd be into Zelda games. So what I mentioned in the 20 minute video about Bokos and Lionels closing an eye while firing, whereas Moblins do not, and some evidence that shows Link probably doesn't, but it's sort of inconclusive, led to a lot of discussion. What I learned is that while it's common for novice archers to close one eye while firing, it narrows your field of view for tracking a target, thus making it not the ideal way to aim, not the way a pro would do it. I guess there's even a whole thing about it in Pocahontas. I didn't retain the information. I'm moving on. So this led me even further down the rabbit hole than I went before. And the first thing I did was confirm that when you see Link in selfie mode as he pulls the bow, he does not close one eye, consistent with the announcement trailer. Check. Cool. And then, luckily, someone came to me with the smoking gun mother load of conclusive evidence. So to answer with 100% confirmation, does or does not Link close one eye in this game while the player is actually playing and firing the bow? The answer is he does not. Not at all. In fact, he makes no facial expression whatsoever. Game developers probably just figured, well, you're never going to see what he's doing with his face. We don't need to animate it for this. But this screenshot right here was pulled from a mod that more or less allows us to move the camera around and analyze the game better and even pinpoint the animations. East of Zora's Domain is a cliff overlooking the East Reservoir Lake, and at the very peak there's a sign that warns to jump at your own risk. A warning you might take seriously considering the place is called Shatterback Point. And the game isn't just being cute with its signage. Now go ahead and jump all you want. It's fun. Link will always perform this beautifully executed jackknife dive. Well, I don't know if it's a jackknife, but it's very graceful. And you can also do a forward pointing lunge chop dive and some kind of cannonball with the sword looking thing. It is so high up that if you drop a bomb from the top, it'll despawn because Link falls so far and fast away from it. But if you drop the bomb somewhere halfway down, it won't despawn. It'll plunge deep into the water and take a good moment to return to the surface. If you detonate the bomb while it's this deep underwater, it's sort of underwhelming. And yet, despite the intense height, it is totally safe to make this jump anytime. But only if you jump from the very tip of the ledge. If you jump off a little bit to the right, you'll still get the dive animation, but Link will dive directly into a bed of rocks. Thus, the name of this place. But over at Proxim, Burgo the bridge guard will talk you down if you hop up on the ledge in front of him. He talks about life with this attitude of upbeat stoicism and he pleads with Link to reconsider. And truthfully, I was trying to jump off the ledge just so he would try to stop me so I could get a shot for this video, but he wouldn't do it. And when I gave up and just went to go relight the torch, then he finally chimed in. I was just trying to relight the torch. I didn't even know it could go out. Like, why would it? I thought maybe there was a secret to unlock. 
throughout the Sri Scablands, Thundra Plateau, and Ludfoe's Bog up in Hyrule Ridge, there are these absolutely massive trees. Whether or not it was intentional is unclear, but they do resemble some real-life trees called the Socotra Dragon Trees or Canary Island Dragon Trees, which only grow to about 30 to 49 feet tall. And these trees out here don't quite have the same canopy, but they do look quite similar. And for a video like this, it's worth mentioning. The Hitano Chief Reese has this sheet on the side of his cabinet next to his corner desk area that says congrats, as in congrats for finding this little Easter egg. Initially, I thought this was a unique little piece, but then I noticed that Proust down the street has it posted all over his shop, so the message isn't that hidden. I'm sure it's probably in other places as well. And Proust also has some signs that say caution. In the 15 minute video, I mentioned the five weapons you can have rebuilt or remade if they break, but that it's barely worth it in my opinion because the hoops you have to jump through to reclaim them, it's, it's just like, why? In addition to those five weapons, you can also replace Urbosa's Daybreaker shield using a diamond, five pieces of flint, and a standard Gerudo shield. Some of you may say that this is useful information, whereas I'm firmly in the belief that a diamond, a flint, and a perfectly good Gerudo shield are worth significantly more than this one cooler looking shield all on its own. Enough said. And of course we're not talking about the Helene shield here because it's cool, I like to use it a lot, and if it ever breaks, an indistinguishable replica is available for simple monetary transactions. But while we're talking about the Daybreaker, if Link has it equipped while he speaks with Selmy, the best shield surfer in all of Hyrule, she'll wonder whether or not she's dreaming. She wants one real bad and it's probably because they're not only sweet looking, they're programmed to take half as much damage as a shield typically would with the durability consumption while surfing. If you pick up a style enemy's head and then carry it around with you, find a quiet place to hang out, you can bring in the camera close and actually hear the growling and grumbling. It'll continue to do this until 5 in the morning when all of a sudden Link will just drop it, it'll plop on the ground and disappear. Link's house in Hitano is right on the edge of town. Now sure that's pretty obvious on the map, but hear me out. You cannot gallop a horse through towns. You have to slow down to a trot or a canter. In fact, if you have spurs charged up, they won't even recharge while you're riding through the town. But partway through Link's yard, you can gallop again. You can even do it in this little fenced in area right behind the house. So it literally is right on the exact border edge of Hateno. And while we're talking about Link's house, it has this shed in the back with a door. Unfortunately, you cannot just walk into the room with normal play through the door. But you can clip through the wall and see this empty brokenness of what's inside. Nothing. Regaro, owner of the Goron City clothing shop, has different responses depending on how appropriately dressed Link is for a Hylian hanging out on Death Mountain. Well, more accurately, he completely freaks out if you try to hold a casual conversation while on fire or close to it. Seems understandable, seems like it's for your safety. He just keeps on warning you to cover up. Until you mention selling him something, then he'll just chill and buy up all your inventory that you offer, including a perfectly good two-star upgraded full fireproof armor. Like, it's so weird. He'll warn me to put it on, but not sell it to me directly. I have to go over to the mannequins if I want to take it. But if he sees that I already have it, he'll just buy it off of me at a big loss and then try to sell it back to me. I thought he cared about my well-being, but he's just a businessman. I tried talking to other Gorons, admittedly not all of them, but none of them other than this guy over here showed that level of concern. Or maybe he just sees an opportunity for rupees in the situation. Or he's trying to avoid a huge insurance and PR disaster. Moblin skulls have the eyes positioned in a way associated with most prey animals. Cow, deer, rabbit, chipmunk, antelope, anything with eyes facing more on the sides of the face for a wider field of view in case predators are trying to sneak up behind them. Not to suggest that moblins are prey animal of course, that is until Link shows up, but the eyes on their heads are in the same place as typical prey animals, not predators. If you want to shoot perfect free throws in the bomb shrine, all you've got to do is stand in this little area here, generally behind the line. 
It's not super exact. Wherever you stand, scope aim at the middle of the funnel to set Link's facing direction, and then, without touching the left control stick, alternate pressing the left bumper to take out a circle bomb and the right bumper to toss it in. If you did it properly, you should never, ever miss a shot. Hey, by the way, I'm supposed to hang out with my buddy LeBron James after this, but he said it was my turn to bring the snacks this time. Does anybody know where I can find some championships? He said they're his favorite. Anyway, you could also shoot Link into this basket, but that's a much more difficult shot from a little farther away. And speaking of making long shots, not to be confused with long shots, there's a boulder on top of this decrepit structure over here on the Great Plateau placed conveniently for you to push down and tumble into these explosives and take the unsuspecting Bokoblins below by complete surprise. But this boulder is also perfectly placed for another surprise attack, and in my opinion, a much more badass one. If you stand in this exact spot and then set Link's facing angle properly towards the eyeball on the right side, then charge the boulder all the way up. I find that using a spear works best for accuracy, and make sure to aim it straight ahead all the way into the red, and you can shoot it through the eyeball of the skull perfectly. Using a Rivali's Gale, you can recreate a scene from the Tears of the Kingdom trailer. If you go to the seven heroine statues out in the desert, one of them has a broken sword. If you stand on the top of the broken off part, do a Rivali's Gale up to where the statue's hands are supposed to be holding on the sword, and you can crudely recreate this shot where Link comes up through the bottom of an overhanging cliff and pops up through the top. <laughs> The Sarjan Bridge crosses the Floria River between two waterfalls. If you stand around the edge of the more downstream one and jump off, Link does a weird jumping somersault animation that I haven't seen happen anywhere else in the game. I tried to get it consistent enough to be like I was at the water park or something, but it takes more practice than that and it's not that important. The entirety of the Hebra Peak is made of ice. Starting around the elevation of the Goma Saga Shrine, the rock suddenly stops or begins being iced over completely by a gigantic glacier. It's kind of translucent and Link cannot climb on this surface. The Sanctum is the highest point of the castle that gives you a new location notification when you enter, but it's not the highest room. Instead of going directly into the Sanctum for the final fights, you can go up one floor where there's another room and you can see the top of Calamity's cocoon coming up through the floor with these malice tentacles, spaghetti noodles of hatred all over the place. You can go down this passage that takes you into the Sanctum and walk along the edge so as not to start the boss fights and make your way over to the throne, which is outside the cutscene trigger area. Well, not really a seat, more like just crouching, but on chairs or stools, something without armrests, if you scoot Link off to the side so that one foot is on and one foot is off, well, then it looks a little bit more like Link is sitting in a relaxed position with terrible posture. Zelda's bedroom leads to this hallway that's immediately blocked off by a bunch of rubble. I don't think you can get to the other side from this direction, but you can get out of bounds and approach this hallway from the back. If you do, you'll find a picture frame back here that you'd otherwise never see, but the portrait inside the frame has been destroyed exactly like the one that's just in bounds over there. Also, if you get Link to grab on high enough on the back of this wall, he'll hang awkwardly as if he's rock climbing at the edge and about to fall. Link's lower half goes flopping around all over the place as he moves at high speed into a wall straight out of a glitch. Namely, two glitches move Link fast enough to get this effect as far as I've seen. I've done it with both Wind Bombs and the BLSS. When I did it with BLSS, I was above water and Link dropped down and when he went down, he disappeared under the surface. While using a camera and while Link is holding a one-handed weapon and enters selfie mode, there's a kind of battle stance pose that he'll strike if you have a shield out. If you pan the camera behind him, you can see the shield clips through the sword sheath pretty badly. But if you don't have a shield equipped, he'll raise that one-handed weapon straight in the air in more of a victory pose. 
With two-handed weapons, he'll do the same pose whether or not you have the shield equipped, it doesn't matter. It's always sunny in Terrytown. It can be stormy or cloudy or any type of weather around the area surrounding. But as you fly in, the weather will change to clear and beautiful as the Terrytown theme music chimes in and the name pops up in the bottom left. I've seen other players claim that they got rain, but they don't show any proof, no footage. I don't have any myself, so I think they're doing something wrong or they're just mistaken. Literally every single time I'm in Terrytown, the weather is gorgeous. From Elden Tower, if you look to the west, this lava formation over here looks like a big smiley face. For best results, you've got to check it out at night. But if you move in closer, the face will start to cry until it loads in enough that it's clearly no longer a face, but instead two streams of lava spewing out of the rock into this lava stream that was the smile. If you have Link jogging forward, not sprinting, just running while holding your bow, and then you unequip the bow using the quick menu. While still moving forward, Link will keep his left arm bent in the same position used to carry the bow. And he'll keep this bend in his elbow until you either stop moving, start sprinting, jump, reach a step up position, take out a weapon, or get hit by an enemy. Probably something else too. Not only that, but you can interrupt the BLSS setup by blowing up the flower lady's flowers to make the bow invisible. Well, sort of. So what happens is it's more of like putting Link into imaginary target practice mode. Link will hold out his arm as if he's got the bow and you can see the crosshairs and the arrow inventory will show, but firing the bow will not lower your inventory by one, nor will you get a sound of a string being plucked or anything like that, as it does when an arrow is fired. The game's code recognizes nine different types of materials for the models of everything that you see. There's terrain, foliage, water, skin, hair, eyes, cloth, metals, and rubber. Rubber is the least abundant resource in the game. As far as my research goes, it's only found in the rubber suit and super interestingly and totally unexpectedly, but according to fellow YouTuber Jasper who dug this up in the code around the Sheikah Slate too, as if Nintendo had created some sort of protective case around it. And the game puts the word rubber in quotation marks when referring to it for some reason and says that this material can no longer be found. And not only that it can't be found, but that it does not exist in this modern age, but yet here it is. The six types of materials that make up Link and all the NPCs and objects around the world are cell shaded. The world materials, water, foliage, and terrain are not. If you want to look more into this, at the bridge over at Lake Hylia on the left side of the gate inside this broken chunk of the wall, the cell shading effect doesn't work. This is most likely some kind of decal texture glitch left over from when the developers were first creating the bridge when it was more structured and then later adding details like overgrown stuff and crumbled bits missing. And when they did this, they missed a spot here programming the different materials or textures how to behave. The effect causes changes in all sorts of things. Your remote bombs shine differently, fire weapons and different armor look pretty cool, the lighting effect around fairies is a bit entertaining to watch as well. And I personally think that star fragments look way, way better. And if you're interested in learning more about the lighting in this game, I've linked Jasper's video in the description. But since you're only in this tight little spot, and yes, there are other spots like this around the world that you can find, it's still much easier to show how cool and realistic the game looks without cell shading anywhere at all. So courtesy of Celio Spring, whose video I've linked in the description, this is what the game looks like without any cell shading. I think it looks super freaking cool. I mean, how I wish that they would have gone with this stylistic choice. Clean it up a little bit, maybe. The choo-choos look pretty dark, but generally speaking, I love this look. It's possible to arrive at the Cryonis Shrine fast enough to get there before it loads. This is an extremely rare but not completely unheard of phenomenon. The one time this lag loading error happened to me, it seems like I got up to the door just as it loaded, but it also kind of looked like I was stopped by the door before it was visible. So I'm not sure if I was just too slow or if it's impossible to get into an unloaded Cryonis while playing this game. It should be possible though because the outdated Stasis first great plateau speedrun did exactly that just to get Link inside the Magnesis shrine faster. Straight from Cryonis, you'd travel down there.
there with a BTB, and if you got lucky, the door was unloaded, you could run right in. But that was largely considered luck based on our current understanding of how the game prioritizes loading different objects. When the game first begins, Link is in his underwear, right? Yeah, well, but what you might not have noticed is that as he steps out of the regeneration bath, that's all he's got on before you activate this first pedestal and get the Sheikah Slate. Once you've picked it up, he gets this belt that comes with it to hold it around his waist. You don't get a chance to see this belt in the cutscene, it's just there once it wraps up, but now he'll have this belt, and the strap that comes around his chest only comes around once you get a shield, sword, bow, or a shirt. But if you have not yet picked up a shield, sword, or bow, and then you take your shirt off, the strap across his chest will come off as well. Once you've equipped a shield, sword, or bow, that strap is on to stay. Ivy, the NPC who sweeps in front of Hateno General Store, takes her broom to bed with her when she sleeps. She spends all day every day just sweeping out front of the store, and then at 9pm sharp, packs it up and goes straight to bed. She'll then wake up at 5 a.m. on the dot and immediately whip out the broom and go back downstairs and start sweeping where she left off again. One thing that's interesting though is that an NPC will not go to bed if you're creeping in the room there waiting for them to do so. They'll just stand there all night long and then at 5 a.m. snap back to regular routine as if that wasn't super duper awkward. <laughs> The glasses Robbie wears may be crafted with Sheikah technology, but for some reason, they make his eyeballs move around like a goofy Liz Alfos every few seconds. Even while you hold him frozen in most dialogue poses, but not while he's deep in thought or in the moment of surprise when he first learns that Pura has gotten younger. If you hold him in those poses, his eyeballs will stay still perpetually. If you look at the interactive map, which I've linked in the description, and you filter to only show the 900 Korok locations, and then you zoom all the way out, you can see how these little guys completely cover the entire map. If I zoomed in closer, obviously that'd be info for another video, but I think it's funny how there's Koroks everywhere except immediately on Death Mountain, on the most extreme cliff sides, and on even Tide Island. And by the way, every time you find a Korok, you get a cutscene that lasts about 5 seconds long. That means if you collect all 900 seeds, that comes out to 4,500 seconds, which divided by 60 gets you 75 minutes, or 1 hour and 15 minutes collectively of Korok cutscenes. And if you include the time it takes to mash through the text boxes after the cutscene, it goes from 5 seconds to 7 seconds, which adds a whole half hour on to bring it to an hour and 45 minutes of Korok time. You can't put that on 2 times speed and watch it faster. Rivali has red circles on his cheeks. This is a trait only exhibited by children and adolescents among the Rito, indicating that he was not yet grown as a full adult when he fought and died, or maybe this is just some war paint. His markings do seem to be a little bit more red instead of the rosy like of other birds. If you want to clean up the area where you had a campfire before you head off, you can just hit the burned pile of wood with a jumping vertical slam chop and it'll disintegrate the pile of burned wood and do one more hit of durability onto your weapon. You can break them up whether they're still on fire or if they're already put out, it doesn't matter, but if you didn't put it there, then you can't break it either. Making the traditional method of campfire cleanup, you know, just leaving it there while you run off to continue playing the game until it eventually despawns on its own much more efficient. You know how when you get the camera in too close to Link, he goes invisible? Well, sometimes you can get the camera in close enough to him that he doesn't go invisible and it goes right up inside his head. For this brief moment, you can literally look out at the world through Link's eyes. And it's freaking creepy. And sometimes while you're doing weird moves or possibly glitching around, you might get the camera in close enough to his face while he's falling or stumbling or losing his balance while he's landing on his shield during a shield jump or whatever. You could see a worried expression of a person who's potentially about to fall down. If you aim up sharp enough, you can play William Tell with an Octorok and give him a real close haircut by aiming just above the where it would be to give it a headshot. Speedrunners already know about this next one, but for casual players, I would imagine it's perfect for a video like this. And that is that this cutscene right here is what initially tells the game's day-night cycle and weather patterns to start working properly. 
if you clip out of the Shrine of Resurrection and avoid entering into this little cutscene trigger area around the front of the Shrine of Resurrection, the game will stay perpetually at 5.15 a.m. with clear and sunny weather and calm winds. And speaking of clipping out of the Shrine of Resurrection, if you ever hang out down here, there's a couple interesting things to do. I mean, just looking at the Shrine of Resurrection from the underside itself is a cool perspective. But the most interesting thing to me is this hole that you can go down and you'll fall way, 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 way down until you eventually clip down into some water area. I don't think there's a way out of here once you're down here. I mean, you're not supposed to be down here. And one of the most interesting things is how cool the lighting changes down here it has this kind of red sky at night vibe and i just think that it's one of the most useless things i could possibly leave you off with and there you go if you want a 45 minute version of this type of stuff leave a like on the video and subscribe to catch it when it comes out and until then stay well and always keep punching out there aloha